pleasure. Coming up here in our last hour of the Washington Journal, we are going to head to Fort A.P. Hill Military Base in Virginia, where C-SPAN's Pedro Echeverria will pick it up from here. And thank you. And the reason that we are on this military base, and if you were to look at it on a map, it's about an hour and a half south of Washington, D.C. The reason we're here is because it's the site of the Asymmetric Warfare Training Center. It's a 300-acre facility designed to replicate in the most detail possible a small city setting, complete with multi-level buildings, a subway, a train station, and even an underground tunnel. The purpose is to have U.S. troops develop and hone skills needed to fight in urban conflict zones across the world. Here to join us to talk about the center and its mission is Colonel John Pekosik. He is the commander of the U.S. Army Asymmetric Warfare Group. Colonel, thanks for joining us. Welcome to C-SPAN. Pedro, thank you for having me. Can you tell us about the buildings behind us, what we're seeing, what the purpose is? Sure, Pedro. Well, what I'd like to do is just kind of put it into context in terms of why we have the, the training center here today is uh, the Asymmetric Warfare Group uh, provides operational advisory support and solution development for the Army and Joint Force Commanders. And really what that means is four things for the, uh, for the service. We provide operational advisors all around the world wherever U.S. forces are deployed. We do that to identify capability gaps. Ultimately, we develop solutions for those gaps and then integrate those back in the Army system. And that's what this facility is really designed for. It's a place to develop solutions uh, for the Army. In addition, it serves a secondary role as an Army training center. So these buildings behind us, they're life-size, they're realistic, but they're fake in a sense, they're, but they're meant for training. Exactly, exactly. Um, I, I recall, I mean, the Army's always looked at uh, the, the need to have a, a diverse places to train. And in the past, uh, I recall, we had training areas that were simple concrete buildings, but they didn't really provide the texture that you need to get that realistic training that our soldiers need today. So as you can see, the buildings behind us have glass and windows and doors and desks and plants, all those kind of things that our soldiers will encounter. A lot of type of different buildings, too, on the campus. Give us a feel of what we'll find. I know that we're viewing an embassy behind us and some apartment buildings, but you have some other structures here as well. Roger, um, what, what we do see, uh, Pedro, is the, the the place is really designed to be able to, to change, to adapt to whatever environment our soldiers might be in. So uh, there's a six-story building out there that may be uh, an, an embassy one day, it may be a hotel another day, it may be a warehouse another day. Uh, so we can change the settings uh, to meet the kind of environments that our soldiers are going to face. And what we're trying to do is provide a place that can serve as a, a variety of training areas so that uh, we can get the most utility for it. During the course of the hour, you're going to see video of soldiers that have been here at Fort AP Hill at the Asymmetric Warfare Training Center running scenarios in these various type of buildings and you'll see a lot of different type of examples which we'll get the colonel to talk about as well but we're going to talk about more about the the purpose of the center the mission of the group and if you want to have questions about this type of training that goes on about this center about how it's used worldwide here's your chance to do so with Colonel John Pekosik of the U.S. Army Asymmetric Warfare Group here's how you can call and ask him questions for those of you in the eastern and central time zones 202-748-8000 for those of you in the Mountain Pacific time zones, 202-748-8001. And for active military, if you want to give your thoughts on this as well, especially if you've had experience in these kind of war zones or areas of the world, 202-748-8002. Colonel, tell us a little bit about the places where, once they're trained here, where do these soldiers go? What kind of uh, involvement are they in worldwide? Well, uh Soldiers today are employed all over the world. When you look at uh, what the U.S. Army is doing and uh, the U.S. military, uh, we do different things. I mean, the recent uh, Ebola uh, breakout in Africa, there were U.S. Army soldiers that are helping. The, uh, the, the earthquake in Nepal, uh, there, the, there's, uh, there's always opportunities there to, to help around the world. So really, it could be anywhere around the world. So the facility is designed uh, for us to be able to re replicate the kind of, uh, kind of environments that uh, we may face around the world when you talked about the, uh, you know, the, uh, the sub Mediterranean portion of it, uh, that's, uh, that's a big thing now. I mean, we have to look at if somebody has to go in to conduct a rescue in a subterranean environment, uh, the first time they should do it is not when they're trying to save someone's life down there. They can go through it here and realize these are the techniques that I need or this is the type of equipment that I need to accomplish those missions. So really, uh, it, it, it supports soldiers deployed all around the world, and that's, uh, that, that's what it's, uh, it's built for, and I think it's tailorable so that we really can replicate any environment. So here. give some examples of recent training that has gone on here and some areas of the world where these troops have been involved. Uh, give us some uh, concrete examples. Well, um, I think one of the best ones that you, 
you, you, you talked about was, uh, you know, the tunnels or the subterranean piece. And um, what what we realized earlier on is you see the you see. Uh, uh, the environments around the world, sometimes you, you see some continuity there. When, when we originally designed this facility, we were heavily engaged in uh, Afghanistan, and at the time, the soldiers faced um, these carezes, which are these water drain systems, and they had, to re they had to understand how to go down into those, how to fight in those things. Uh, so it started off uh, in that way. Uh, but when you look at the subterranean threat and you look at other places around the world where that can apply is, uh, you look at um, uh, bunkers where chemical weapons might be stored in, uh, in in a country that you've got to recover, like in Syria, where they took them out and destroyed them. Somebody's got to be able to go in there and do that. Or uh, so the subterranean threat is one that you might see uh, anywhere around the world. And those are just uh, two locations that you might see that. In fact, we have video of folks uh, 1,500 feet of tunnel. If I understand it, you can't see it, but we have video of it of soldiers in training. And again, that's part of the training that goes here at the Asymmetric Warfare. Uh, Training Center. Uh, again, we're here to take your calls and talk to Colonel John Pekosik, uh, the commander of the Asymmetric Warfare Group. First call for you, Commander, is from Herbie in Moss Point, Mississippi. Herbie, you're on with the commander. Go ahead. Uh, good morning, Chief Span. Yes, uh, these buildings look like the United States uh, building because, you know, the way the uh, police are throwing black people in the inner cities and the uprising that we're having here in America. It looks like we're getting to, get to fight against our own people here. And it looks like y'all are training to more, more or less invade the inner city. Or, you know, it, it, it's mighty strange because everybody's training to do something overseas. And it doesn't look like overseas training. It looks like this is right here in America. And it's kind of scary because of the situation where we can't get police locked up for what they're doing to civilians and uh, the stuff that's going on here in America. So it's quite, quite, it's kind of damaging. Y'all are doing something secretly here, I think. Herbie, um, th that's uh, not really true. Um, what we're doing is training U.S. soldiers to be able to operate in any contingency around the world. When you look at what uh, U.S. Army soldiers do, they have to be able to operate along a contingency uh, from you know disaster relief to you know high-end military conflict, and that's what the the center is really designed for. It's to be able to replicate any environment that we might have to fight in. I mean, we as as we said earlier on, we are in Virginia, and that's where we live. I mean, we're U.S. soldiers. We're stationed uh, in uh, in the United States. Uh, and so the, the, the center is located here, so it's convenient and easy to train on. But really, uh, that, what you said is uh, farthest from the truth. It's really, we want to be able to replicate any environment where our soldiers might be able to fight. Uh, as I'd said uh, earlier, that uh, you know, we used to train in very rudimentary training facilities where it was these simple concrete buildings, uh, and our soldiers really weren't prepared as well as they could have been uh, by just adding a little bit of texture to make it as realistic as possible. Uh, ultimately, this facility is designed uh, to increase soldier survival survivability and, and save lives in combat. And that's what it's for. And I, I think that uh, if, if we put it in that context, that's really what the U.S. Army is doing at this facility. 202-748-8000 for those of you in the Eastern and Central Time Zones. For the Mountain and Pacific, 202-748-8001. And for active military, 202-748-8002. Our guest, Colonel John Pekosik of the U.S. Army Asymmetric Warfare Group. John Breezewood, Pennsylvania, you're up next. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I'm concerned, like the last caller, I saw videos of your facility on the Internet. I saw videos of individuals in John Deere caps saying, please don't take my guns, and other military training exercises that have been videotaped and have been put on the Internet. Now, what safety or what do we have to guarantee us that these training facilities aren't being used to confiscate our guns in case of uh, another economic meltdown like we had in 2008 that uh, like the gun confiscation that went on in Katrina the U.S. troops from Afghanistan walked the streets of New Orleans and confiscated every gun that was there. What, what do we have to guarantee that we will be protected from that not happening in mass like it did in Katrina? Thousands of guns were confiscated, confiscated by regular army and by National Guard units. Well, I can't speak uh, about what happened uh, in uh, in uh, Katrina, but what I can say is, uh, you know, I 
I know that everything on the internet is not necessarily true uh, uh, as we see it. And really, when you come back to what the facility is designed for and what we do here, uh, we, we share it very openly where there's no, no secrets to be had. Uh, when you talk about what protects us, well, you know, the United States Constitution is what protects us, and, and that's what the U.S. Army is here for, to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And, uh, and I would, uh, would, would hope that all of our, uh, you know, our, our listeners and viewers out there uh, would, uh, would appreciate what our soldiers are doing for us on a day-to-day -day basis. It's really uh, the opposite of what the caller had articulated. It's really to, to protect the United States. If the idea is to come up with solutions to situations across the world, how are those solutions developed? Who comes up with the strategies? How, and how does it end up as a working model here at the center? Well, you know, the, when you talk about the, uh, the subterranean piece, Pedro, I think that's really a great example. We, when we realized that we had difficulty, uh, whether it was operating in the Kerezes of Afghanistan or in bunkers or how are you going to get into these places, what we're able to do as an organization is let's look at some of the historical examples. Uh, for uh, In the past, the last time the U.S. Army really faced a threat like this was in the tunnels in Vietnam. So we had a chance to kind of look at how did our soldiers fight there? How did they fight in Okinawa? What did we learn from those things? And then we're able to use this facility to really replicate those type of conditions. So we, we use the facility to build underground, uh, underground bunkers and realize, hey, if there's a metal door, how are we going to breach that door? Once we breach that door, how are we going to get in there? What if we have to evacuate casualties from those areas? So we develop both material and non-material solutions. So we, we may learn that it's the particular way you carry your kit, or we may realize that you need a different type of kit to operate in that environment. How are you going to breathe in that environment? What if there's a, a fire and smoke in that environment? How are you going to operate? And what are the techniques? So, so really, that's one of the great things that we do here, Pedro. And uh, I guess once we do that, what's really special about uh, this particular organization, what we do for the Army, is we've got the ability to take what we've learned and institutionalize it. That's really what it's about, is how quickly can the Army learn? Uh, when we talk about, you know, what's special about the United States Army, um, it's, it's not about the tanks or the ships or, uh, you know, the, the, the things that we have. It's about the people and, and, the, and our ability to adapt uh, rapidly and more rapidly than our adversary is really what's special here. So I think this is really a location where we can adapt quickly and you can see change happen right here at Fort AP Hill. So for, before we go too far in, this topic of asymmetric warfare, define what it is in English. It, it generally describes a change in nature as far as those who would use this type of warfare in, in conflict zones or other places in the world. How do you define it? Well, when, when I think about asymmetric warfare, you know, what I think about is uh, that there are two dissimilar forces, either the way they approach a, a fight or the equipment they have, um, and you, you don't attack your enemy's strength, you attack his weakness, and you have to protect your own. Uh, I think the best way for me to articulate is when you think about uh, the way World War I was fought, uh, that, was not, that, was, that was a symmetric conflict. It was all about who had the most guns and how many soldiers could get on the ground. But the armies were essentially the same, and it was just who could get there the fastest with the most. Uh, and you had two very similar forces clashing with each other. Uh, but at a point during that war, somebody came up with the idea of, hey, what if we put a machine gun under the cover of armor and we call it a tank? That is an asymmetric approach to try to overcome your adversary uh, by attacking his, uh, his attacking his weaker point, and that would be able to attack with a, uh, you know, a tank. So that's how warfare has evolved. As you, uh, if you're going to succeed in conflict, you don't want to attack your enemy's strengths; you want to attack his weakness. And you really, when you go into a conflict like that, and you want soldiers uh, to survive and come home. Home, you want to make sure it's not a fair fight and that U.S. soldiers are equipped as best they can and best prepared for that type so of conflict. For the nature of the city that we're seeing behind us, is ur are urban centers then the new battleground? Well, when you look at uh, what's happening in the world today, um, there's a huge population growth. A lot of times we look at the growth of these mega cities uh, all over the world where there's, there's millions and millions of people uh, in the very close quarters. And if, if conflict is going to occur in regions like that, we want our soldiers to be able to understand the techniques that they've got to be able to apply in those environments. You want to do it here at Fort AP Hill, do it here in Virginia. The first time, you know, we call on our soldier to have to figure out how are you going to get to the top of that. Uh, that, that five-story building with no elevator, uh, no ropes, uh, is here at Fort AP Hill as opposed to some far-off land. Uh, Lenny from Prescott, Arizona, you are next for our guest. Go ahead. Yes, good morning, Colonel. Um, I wanted to <clears throat> alert our citizens and to get an explanation, if we could, for an exciting uh, military training called Jade Helm 15, 
which is all over the Internet. I guess it involves 10 states, and there's going to be civilians participating in towns like Big Spring, Texas. Um, could you explain the magnitude of that and what the purpose of that is? And, and apparently you're going to have crisis actors, and, and there are going to be soldiers dressed in uniform and not in uniform. And apparently it's very exciting. Could, could you explain that to us? Thank you very much. Unfortunately, it's it's not something that I'm familiar with, so I, I, I can't really explain that. Uh, but I do know that uh, those type of things are, are things that we do here, where we get our soldiers the opportunity to work within an environment where there are uh, civilians and, and soldiers. As a matter of fact, one of the things I, I, I could talk about is that, and unfortunately, I just don't know uh, about that particular exercise. But when you talk about soldiers operating within an environment where they're civilians, one of the things we're looking at here at Fort AP Hill is a program of using autonomous robots. Essentially what we do is uh, we've taken a number of robots that can operate independently, walk up and down these streets. We can dress some up in uniforms, we can dress some up in civilians clothes, and we can use that as a chance here at AP Hill to train our soldiers how to discriminate uh, between friendly forces, forces that may ev be evacuated, and that's just one of, those, uh, one of those great things that we're able to do at AP Hill. Again, I'm sorry, I'm just not familiar with that exercise. Uh, Tim, Palm Harbor, Florida, you're next. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, good morning. Uh, I just wanted to differentiate the people who formulate our policy and the people who implement it. There's a big difference being the politicians versus the uh, patriotic individuals like your colonel there. But I'm just wondering, now, now we're going international urban warfare. Who, who sets the goals here? That, uh, or, or, or why, why are we going around the world now and, and apparently getting involved in international urban warfare? We're meddling in every country all over the world. We're hated everywhere. And we get these things called blowback. We have people coming in here and doing things like they do in Texas. I know that was provoked, but there's only going to be more of that. When are we going to mind their own business? I thought we were broke, and, and all we have is this uh, ongoing militarism of the, of the country. And, and a lot of people I think I, I, I speak for, we support the people in the military. We don't support the people formulating these wacko policies, like overthrowing a government in Ukraine and putting in uh, people who are not elected all because there's a, there's a trouble with Russia because Russia is creating a basket of currencies because Russia has bases in the Crimea and they can interfere with the U.S. starting more problems in the Middle East. So uh, can you respond to that? Thank you. Well, you bring up a good point in that the, the world has changed uh, quite a bit in, the, in just the short time that I've been in the military. When I, I first came in the Army, uh, what, what really drove you know, our military strategy was something called air land battle, where we had to be able to fight, outnumbered, and win against an enemy. That's what, when I first came in as I was a lieutenant and the Cold War was still going on, that was the world we faced. And, and that was just really a, it was a math problem. It was, we've got to have better tanks and better aircraft, and we've got to be able to fight a force that we know in a very symmetric way. Well, the, the world has changed, and, and the Army has changed with it. Uh, the Army's really changed their operating concept to say, what, what do we want our soldiers to be able to do now? And that's fighting a complex world where, uh, where asymmetric threats are out there. This, uh, this uh, uh, facility that you see here today is, is meant to replicate that so we can really prepare our soldiers to do things uh, where we, we might not know they are, they're going to have to operate in the future. So uh, again, I, I really think that uh, the facility itself here is designed uh, to serve our Army and, and help our soldiers face those challenges that they're going to face uh, in the future because we really don't know what, what that's going to be. It's a very complicated world out there and things have changed and, and we really want our soldiers to be those agile and adaptive uh, leaders uh, and soldiers so that we can you know, accomplish what our nation asks us to the do. The Fort AP Hill Military Base in Virginia is where you'll find the Asymmetric Warfare Training Center, 300 acres, uh, part of it specifically devoted to these buildings that we've been showing you uh, this morning. Also, uh, tunnels underneath and various type of structures on the campus. Uh, we'll go next to Justin, Petaluma, California. Thanks for calling. Go ahead. Thank you very much for taking my call. I got to reflect what a lot of the callers have said today. And as I'm watching the program now, this is just very scary stuff. This looks almost like uh, Western or American cities rather than being prepared for, for what we're going to face out in other countries. And, you know, oh, the colonel has said we've got to be prepared for this and, and all of that. This is almost every caller, and the people that are listening right now, I think, understand that this is a very, um, a, a very scary 
and new thing that the military looks like it's going to be taking on that could be against uh, its very own people, uh, American people. Everything I've seen except for this one mosque has been in English. It says Main Street. Main Street. Um, you know, okay, we'll the let church. Her, we'll let our guest respond, caller. Um, what I'd say is it, it is a very complicated world out there, and, and you shouldn't find it uh, scary or frightening. You should find it reassuring that, uh, that we're training our soldiers to be able to operate across a broad spectrum of uh, facilities. You know, when I had said is I've been, I've been in the Army a little bit of time, and when I first come in, we spent all our time uh, walking through the woods, learning how to fight in, uh, in, in the wood line, how to navigate with a map and compass and areas like that, um, and then come to realize when we were called by our nation to, to perform a mission, we were operating in an urban center. And how we did that, uh, whether it was uh, you know us helping uh, soldiers uh, or our soldiers operating uh, in the current uh, or the uh, the conflicts that uh, that we most recently operated in, all of those were in an urban environment uh, where we had to learn how to operate uh, in and among uh, where people are. Because really, uh, the U.S. military, uh, as we operate uh, across the world, uh, there are there are enemy forces and they mix themselves in uh, with friendly forces all the time and as you know the robot example that I gave up we need to be able to have our soldiers discriminate uh, between uh, uh, between what's what's friendly and what's enemy you know when I was uh, uh, going up, growing up in the army one of the things they always used to say uh, about uh, about our soldiers is hey uh, you, you you know a soldier is really doing the right thing um, when they do the right thing when nobody's watching them uh, and that was really how you said hey the, our soldiers are really disciplined and doing the right thing well as the world has changed now what we have to be able to ask our soldiers to do is do the right thing when the whole world is watching because as you said there are a lot of things out there and they're on the internet uh, and we whatever we do is going to be out there and broadcast we don't have any secrets to hide when really this is a great opportunity for us to showcase what our soldiers are doing uh, for the American people to the caller's point you do have a, a replica church and a replica mosque on campus why the importance of these structures well, you know, when I, when I look at the church, I, I, I do have to reflect. It, 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 it's, it could be a church today. It could be a town hall tomorrow. It could be, uh, you know, a store the next day. And what's really important about, uh, about the environment is as we, as we replicate is we want our soldiers to be sensitive to the fact that, uh, that all these things are going to be encountered when they're out, uh, out operating around the world. Uh, and we all know the media reports of, of soldiers uh, causing harm to, uh, to our cause uh, by being, insensitive to those things so by having those located here we can sensitize our soldiers to the fact that hey you're going to be operating around sites that are very sensitive those are the kind of things that people will be will, will be very emotional about and, and we want to make them comfortable operating in an environment here uh, in in Virginia before they go forward you know when you talk about that that comfort level uh, you know an earlier uh, an earlier commander of the uh, the group used to say you have to be comfortable uh, being uncomfortable but what what we expect our soldiers to do today is in this in this chaotic world we live in we've got to be able to not only be comfortable uh, in these uh, these chaotic situations we're expecting our soldiers to thrive in that kind of environment because that's the world we live in and that's what we're trying to do here at Fort AP Hill is provide them an environment with all these different uh, uh, cues that are going to cause them to think because that's really what we want our soldiers to do. Our, our motto as an organization as the Asymmetric Warfare Group is think, adapt, anticipate. That's what we want our soldiers to do here in Virginia before we call them and put them in harm's way. You're speaking or you're hearing from Colonel John Pekosik, uh, the commander of the Asymmetric Warfare Group of the U.S. Army, talking about this training center, talking about this training goes on, asymmetric warfare as it's known, and uh, taking your questions on it. We're going to go next up to Vincent, Dayton, Ohio. Thanks for holding on. Go ahead. Sir, uh, my question is, are the uh, National Guard units and domestic law enforcement authorities also using this center for their training? Well, Vincent, um, all different types of units use the facility is that it's a it's a national asset it's a military asset uh, and so it's used at all different times and uh, even uh, this afternoon it's going to be used by a unit that's coming in as a, as law enforcement units uh, to to understand hey how do I how do I operate in these environments so it, it's not just uh, the army it's the joint force so we use this facility uh, by the army Navy Air Force Marines um, other government agencies use it and they use it in order to 
basically uh, come here so they can train to do what we're going to ask them to do uh, wherever that may be around the world. So um, it, uh, it's, it's used by a number of organizations and all those organizations uh, are able to benefit from the really the investment that the, uh, the American people uh, uh, made here in Virginia. Really, that's what we're trying to do here. Is as we, you know, we built this facility, and it, and it is, it's great. It's really, uh, it's one of those places where you can, you can broaden the, the possibilities for training to things we may not have even thought of and that's really what we uh, what we're trying to achieve here and sometimes we learn from our partners in that respect we may uh, work with other organizations that say hey here's a here's a way that you can go down into a tunnel and be able to breathe that we may not have explored as an army and this is one of those places where we can share information like that are there international partners that come here and train um, they they have come here periodically, um, and for an example, uh, one of the things we might do is um, typically uh, what we do as in the asymmetric warfare group is we work by with and through uh, other U.S. organizations. So we may not necessarily uh, work with foreign forces, but other other elements do. And uh, one of the things that we've looked at is when when soldiers come up upon a facility, and it might be a an IED making facility, or it might be uh, you know a drug lab, or it might be one of those kind of uh, you know kind of facilities, we replicate those here and can bring them in so they can see it firsthand here before they're faced with uh, faced with that uh, in in reality. And uh, I, it comes to mind just because one of the, our recent partners uh, here is we've been working with uh, the Mexicans, and as they they've come up here to look at the facility and say, how do you differentiate between you know what's an IED lab and what's a drug lab? And when I go into one of these facilities, they're they're dangerous things that can hurt you. I mean, if you if you break this glass jar and some kind of a gas comes out and it, it injures either uh, soldiers or law enforcement. Uh, that's the kind of thing we want them to do here uh, before they're faced with that challenge in real life. Here is Susan Goodyear, Arizona. Good morning. Good morning. It's so nice to hear you. Carl, um, I want to thank you. I want to thank you. I want to thank all the military, Army, Navy, Reserve, everybody, because if anything ever happens to the United States, I hope to God that you guys are standing next to us to protect me and my family. The last seven years, I feel that I have not been safe here in the United States. Me and a whole bunch of people. So I just want to thank you. Keep doing what you're doing. Train those military because one day we're going to need them to save us. So thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Susan. I really appreciate that, and that's uh, th that's why I really uh, I, I thank you for this opportunity because a chance for us to showcase what our soldiers are doing for the nation is is it's really our obligation because uh, there's there's not a lot of chances where uh, we get to interact uh, with uh, you know with the, the the people we come from. I mean, we're all the soldiers that uh, that are in our army are from you know from every state in the nation, uh, and it's it's us. I mean, we're a reflection of our society, and a chance for us uh, to to highlight hey what great things our soldiers are doing for our nation around the world. Uh, it's, it's always a pleasure. So again, thank you for that call. Rebecca Mechanicsville, Virginia, go ahead. Hi. Um, I just, first of all, I want to thank you so much for all that you are all doing and, and for all the soldiers that are both in training there and then are deployed. And I know that you all work hard every day to prepare them, and thank you for that. Um, my question is, how long does it typically take a unit um, to stay there and be trained before they are deployed or sent out um, into the field? Well, Rebecca, it really depends on uh, on the unit uh, in in the mission they're being called on to do. So uh, I can't answer that specifically. But units that rotate through here uh, typically come for short periods of time. Um, it's it's not a place where there's a lot of soldiers uh, stationed and trained. And when I was uh, uh, in a a little while ago in a previous life, I was stationed up in, in Fort Drum, New York uh, with an infantry battalion. Um, and even before this facility was built down here, uh, we came down to Fort AP Hill to train for a period of several weeks because of the great uh, facilities that are down here. And now as I reflect back on this, this was a couple years before this was built. Um, I would have, you know, uh, would have been able to really uh, benefit from these facilities that are here. But typically, uh, it's a couple weeks that soldiers come and go here to train. Uh, you bring up uh, one thing that I, I might like to highlight is one of the things that we do here which typically takes about oh, about a two-week period is um, help our soldiers 
uh, become agile and adaptive. A lot of people talk about uh, when you when you look at soldiers and uh, what do you want them to be and what do you how do you want them to be able to react? You want them to be confident and responsible and trustworthy. All those kind of intangible things that you want uh, in you know not only soldiers but good citizens. Well, those things are kind of hard to train. And if you ask someone, how do you make someone responsible and how do you make them adaptable? Well, that's a huge part of our effort here at Fort AP Hill. Uh, we bring them through, and uh, Pedro, as you came through earlier and you saw some of our soldiers training, we build scenarios to kind of challenge our soldiers, to put them in those uncomfortable situations so they can make the right decisions uh, when we send them to missions around the world. And you know, as I said, we send our soldiers around the world and uh, everybody's watching and we want them to be able to make the right decisions. 202-748-8000 for the Eastern and Central time zones, 202-748-8001 for the Mountain and Pacific time zones and for active military if you want to give your thoughts as well. 202-748-8002. We've showed you the buildings. We've showed you some of the scenarios that go on here at the Asymmetric Warfare Training Center. One of the things that we had a chance to also experience was some of the shooting skills training that these soldiers received. We had a chance to talk with Lieutenant Colonel Justin Sapp about the weapons training taught at the center and why it's important. What you see is individual soldiers from the Asymmetric Warfare Group preparing to occupy the range and do some uh, uh, training. And what they're going to do specifically is they're going to put on some uh, protective masks, like gas masks, for lack of a better word, and they're going to do some marksmanship training out to about 50 meters in, uh, in the near future. And so that is sort of the focus for this morning's uh, event. And uh, in the recent past, they've done some other training out to varying distances, both pistol and rifle. Why is this type of skill training important to the overall nature of asymmetric warfare? Well, we are by our nature and by inception an operational advisory group. That's an Army unit that goes out and, and we advise uh, Army and Joint Force units throughout the world. And so some of those uh, uh, areas are, are conflict zones like Iraq and Afghanistan, for example. And so it's very important that your skills, your combat skills, defensive or offensive or, or well honed and so this is part of any unit's preparation for those kind of eventualities and we just happen to focus on the pistol and rifle marksmanship more than probably your average unit because we just don't know what sort of situation our advisor are going to encounter especially when they're embedded with a another unit uh, whether it's a you know army unit or a joint joint force unit and again, that was Lieutenant Colonel Justin Sapp. Let's go to Regina, Mechanicsville, Virginia. You're on with Colonel John Pekosik, the commander of the Asymmetric Warfare Group. Go ahead. Good morning, sir. Um, I would like to know how this urban training uh, conflicts with the Posse Comitatus Act. And I'll take my answer off well, there. Thanks. Great. Thank you for your call. You have to explain a little bit of that too, sir. Roger. Well, well thank you very much for the call. And again, it, it doesn't conflict with the, the Posse Comitatus Act. And really, that's that the uh, you know, United States Army doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't do law enforcement duty. That's the, uh, the duty of our civil authorities. Uh, but we do operate within environments where there are you know, civilians and soldiers operating together. Um, so uh, again, to, to answer your question directly, it doesn't. Uh, but what it really does is provide us an opportunity uh, to, to become accustomed to operating uh, in areas where uh, where civilians and friendlies are operating and makes our soldiers better and able to uh, to perform their mission you know as as, as Justin uh, Sapp had uh, talked about in that segment there there's a there's a number of basic skills that we want our, all our soldiers to be able to do we want them to be able to shoot and hit their target we want them to be able to to maneuver environment those are the those are the essentials of any uh, of any uh, military operation but when you overlay that on top of the complex world that we live in we want our Soldiers to be able to operate and decide. It's not whether you know you're going to hit the target. It's whether uh, you should shoot or you should not shoot, and be able to make decisions very rapidly in a complex environment. And that's really what we're trying to achieve at the, you at the center. You talk about civilians and military together. One of the replicas here on site is a metro station, very lifelike in the means. Why is it important to have that 
And how do you kind of account for civilian, dealing with civilians in these kind of situations? Well, you know, our soldiers uh, have got to be able to operate in, in all different environments. And, and what you saw down there, uh, you know, looks like a metro station, and we've used it in the past for other things. We roll out the metro cars, and the next day we roll in a flatbed uh, rail car, and it's a, a hidden gun that our soldiers are going to go after. Next day we roll it out uh, and put some tanks on it, and it's chemical weapons that our soldiers are going to have to go after. So uh, just like any part of the facility here, we're able to tailor it to the mission set that we're, we're going to face. But in this case, when you look at, uh, you know, underground rail, systems, those are prevalent in most major cities uh, in the country today, and it's one of those things that um, I, I, I can't think of another place where I've trained where I ha would have the opportunity to understand what would happen if I encountered a facility like that. What decisions do we want our soldiers to make? When, it's, when you go down there and you turn off the lights and the place is filled with smoke uh, and you're trying to uh, you know, recover, uh, recover someone that might be injured or you're trying to fight your way through it, let's do that here at Fort A.P. Hill and, and provide provide our soldiers a, that complex environment uh, that they can train on before we ask them to do it elsewhere. Rhonda from Springfield, Massachusetts, you're next. Hi, good morning, thank you. Um, here where I came across some um, police officers training in a cold store at a mall for some kind of urban warfare. My question is, with terminologies like the World War government and a global society, with the Patriot Act being in place, and Barack always using the terminology domestic terrorism, can at any time this asymmetrical army be used here in the United States against the people? Uh, well, I. The short answer is, is no, and uh, there's really not uh, you know, not an asymmetrical army per se. But you know what you bring up is an interesting point when you say you know you see you see training in a facility where maybe they have to you know close off a mall so they can kind of train on what are they going to do if they've got to react to uh, an incident like that happened in Kenya just a short time ago where uh, there was a, an event and people had to go and train on to do that. Well, instead of shutting down the mall for for law enforcement to train on those things, why don't you bring them to Fort AP Hill where they can replicate it here uh, and actually get those techniques down so we can we can do what we're going to ask them to do without being an extra imposition on the uh, on the uh, on the the environment we live in. When you talk about the uh, the metro station, that's uh, that's another great example of it. I mean, I, uh, I as you, Pedro, you know, have a commute uh, to work each day, and uh, and I would be pretty disappointed if uh, if the metro wasn't running on time because uh, someone else was training in there. So we can do that kind of thing here and not inconvenience you know our day to day lives. You talked about training taking place in international areas as there are considerations for if an incident ever happens in the United States and how the army deals with that. Well. We well, Pedro, you know, the, 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 one of the uh, missions uh, of the, uh, uh, for example, uh, you know, the National Guard is to react in the case of a national emergency. And if there was a, an emergency where we had to send soldiers into a place uh, to provide relief, um, as they, they've done in a numerous occasions when there's been floods or, or, or hurricanes in particular, um, this is the kind of thing that they, they could do is get an opportunity uh, to, to do those kind of tasks. I know with the, uh, with the recent uh, uh, hurricane that we had a few years ago in New York, uh, there were metro stations that were flooded. Uh, and uh, this would be the kind of place where you could figure out those techniques. Uh, if the military's ever called on, you want to make sure that they're ready to perform those missions. And that's one of those things that um, the Army doesn't have a, a a lot of luxury when 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 we're called on, uh, we're we're not the kind of uh, we're we're expected to be there and be ready to do whatever we're asked to do. If the army's called on to help out in a situation, uh, one wouldn't expect it to say, "Well, we'll be ready in a couple weeks." That's something we haven't thought about yet. Let's let's get ready for it now. When when the American people call on the military to perform a mission, we expect them to be ready, and that's really what the, the beauty of the facility is here. Is we're able to look at some of these unconventional things that we might ask our soldiers to do and. and and, and make them ready for those. David, Colleen, Texas. Hi, go ahead. Uh, yes, I'd like to make a comment. I'm retired military, and uh, back in the uh, late 80s, we did some training here at Fort Hood at the um, mock up stations. And uh, me being an armor crew member and a tank commander, it helped our troops, our, our, our team, our platoon to actually learn how to uh, fight in urban warfare so that when we went overseas, we knew what to do, and we were uniformity. Everybody knew what they had to do. And as a tanker, and, you know, you never get off your tank unless you have to, but now if something happens to your vehicle and you're on foot, you know what to do to help out the infantry or the medics or whoever to, um, to survive, for one. And the training itself is worth it. All of our soldiers, airmen, and um, Marine Corps need to go through some kind of training like this here because they need it when they go overseas. 
you know, I, I really appreciate that comment, and uh, uh, I, I myself had, had served in a number of kind of uh, types of unit, and uh, uh, a few years ago when uh, everyone's familiar with the Battle of Fallujah, and, uh, you know, I had the opportunity to participate uh, in, the, in that part of the conflict, and, and as you talk about armored vehicles operating in an urban, urban environment, is something we didn't train on. Uh, when I was uh, uh, training up before we went over to Iraq, uh, we trained on large ranges in, uh, in, in Germany, and we looked at how are we going to engage enemy tanks at a range of 2,000 meters, and that's that's what we trained for. And the, but when we were called upon to do it, and we were moving down the streets of Fallujah with M1 tanks uh, engaging the enemy uh, at a very very close range, I, w I wish I would have had that kind of training before we were called to do it uh, uh, live in combat. If I understand it correctly, the Asymmetric Warfare Group had its starts dealing with IEDs. Is that correct? That's correct, Pedro. And uh, the when you as the uh, as the conflict evolved about ten years ago, uh, the enemy engaged us in an asymmetric way. And the enemy engaged us with IEDs, which was something that we didn't face very often. These improvised explosive devices were a threat to our vehicles. Our our light-skinned vehicles weren't equipped to deal with that. And so, born of that uh, was the asymmetric warfare group. And and what we were chartered with doing is let's look at these threats, identify these gaps before we face them so that we can be prepared for them beforehand. And uh, exactly as you talk about uh, the IED, and the world has, has changed even in the last 10 years uh, since, uh, since the group was formed. When you think about uh, what, what we're seeing on, on television, uh, just an example is uh, these small uh, unmanned aerial systems. Uh, so you see these quadcopters, and I remember uh, during the during the Super Bowl they had put out a thing: no no quadcopters. Everybody's got them, and they're flying them around. Uh, and we see them all over the world. Even uh, even in uh, D.C., there uh, you see one uh, that that landed in an unexpected area. So this is a, an asymmetric threat. Uh, and so that is one of the missions of the Asymmetric Warfare Group. We look at this and say, well, how how can uh, we use this? How can the enemy use this? So unlike the, uh, the, the encounter we had previously with the IED, we can prepare our soldiers how to react to that. And this is one of those places that we've done that. It's just an example. It's just a very short time ago um, at this very training center, we, we would run a, a platoon uh, through this area and uh, bring in uh, those small little quadcopters and see how they react to them. Uh, and then we're able to say, well, if you're encountered with the threat, what should you be doing? How do you identify that? How do you stop it? What's it doing? Is he, what's he watching? What's he reporting back? That's exactly the kind of thing that we do here at Fort AP Hill, is develop the tactics, techniques, and procedures to counter these emerging threats, just like we did with the uh, improvised explosive devices. Uh, John Buffalo, New York, go ahead. Yeah, folks, <clears throat> let us uh, not kid ourselves. Uh, this country is never again going to send its troops into mass urban warfare. That's all gone. If we get into a situation where someone's going to ask us to uh, take out a whole city of people or a bunch of terrorists, we're going to light it up or we're going to nuke them. There's no question. <clears throat> this facility is to train the soldiers to fight in American urban cities. And it's coming, folks. Uh, <laughs> 25 years ago, so caller, I went into Poland. So, caller, let me ask what convinces you of that. All came down. Let, let me finish, please. After they dropped the wall, I went into Poland, and I was appalled to find out that people were required to carry identification with them at all times and let the government know where they were. I was appalled at that, being an American citizen. Okay, that's 25 years ago. The other thing, one last comment. I live in Buffalo, New York, and I see in South Buffalo there's a large military storage center that has suddenly popped up just off the highway where there's all kinds of military equipment being stored there for some reason. I can't imagine why. I'll take, my com I'll take your comments off the air. Colonel, go ahead. John, uh, you really can't predict what the future is going to do, and to, to say that we're never going to do anything in the future, uh, I think, in terms of the Army, uh, would be short-sighted when you talk about uh, urban fighting in an urban area. When we fought uh, in Vietnam in the Battle of Way City, that was that was a huge, huge urban fight, uh, and we learned a lot from that and said, "Wow, that, that, there's there's a lot going on there." And to say we'll never do it again uh, was just wasn't correct. We, as as soldiers uh, and as a nation, we don't know what. 
the future holds, and we can't predict it. Uh, but to, to say we're not going to fight in a particular way, well, our enemy has is, is got to vote in that, and, and they're going to determine uh, how and where we may have to fight in the future. And we can't exclude any possibilities. And as an army, we've got to be prepared for those possibilities. As, as I had said uh, with the previous caller, is that, uh, you know, I, I've been called on to do a lot of things I never thought I would have to do in the military. Uh, and uh, I, I, I've all, you always think about how could you have better prepared for that uh, with time and facilities. And that's really what we're trying to achieve here is provide our soldiers the best chances of not only surviving but thriving in combat. Everything that we do at this location is really designed uh, to increase our soldier survivability. So I have no idea what the future is going to hold. And we spent a lot of time, uh, uh, you know, talking about what, what the threat could be. And as soon as you decide, ah, the threat will be that we'll never fight in cities, then in an asymmetric warfare way, our, our enemy will say, well, they, the U.S. is not prepared for that. That's where we need to draw them in. So we've got to prepare, be prepared for a broad spectrum of operations and that's what we're trying to achieve. We've here. heard a lot of calls this morning about people expressing a concern. Is there a perception issue then about the work that you do here and the type of training that do, you do, do you think? Well, you know, as people look at, uh, you know, what's available uh, on, on the media, and the media is much more uh, open than it had been in the past in terms of what's available on the Internet uh, to what's available on, the, uh, on print and, uh, and, and TV media, and there's a lot of different opinions out there, and I think that you'll see a, a larger, broader scope of opinions, and some people may gravitate to a, a, a certain opinion that may uh, may suit uh, you know their 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 preconceived notions and that's why the, in, uh, an interview like this is so important because really we're we, you know we're opening up to the uh, you know not only to the United States but the world and say hey this is this is what we've got here and there's there's nothing to hide and in fact what we're trying to do is say here here are the American soldiers these are your soldiers these are the soldiers are that are gonna they, they're chartered with protect and defend the United States of America and this is what they're doing and they are fantastic. Uh, and any chance we get, a, get to highlight what they're doing, where they're training, we want to share that with the American people. Next up, Stephen from Connecticut. Go ahead. Hey, thanks. That caller was kind of kooky. I would, I would love to have the third army invade when in Connecticut. Of course, they'd have to sign up for PPA. Um, this asymmetrical warfare is the premier facility in the United States. We have uh, Vladimir Putin over there marching across. He's 3 0. Crimea, uh, Georgia, uh, this, 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 uh, Chechnya. He's 3 0. He wants Poland. He wants Estonia. He wants Latvia. We have to get our friends from Poland and all across the NATO north to come to our facility to train them on how to stop. How do, how do we bleed his army this summer? And, and, uh, and for those kooky callers, I would love to have the United States Army in my town. Build a base in Connecticut. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your your call and for you know your confidence in our uh, our soldiers and uh, that's something that we really are trying to share here. You bring up a really interesting point when you talk about the complex things that are going on in the world and you brought up a specific scenario. What we what we try to do at, at the uh, asymmetric warfare training center here is uh, is not look so much as the the who of what's going on in the world but the what that's going on in the world. So when we look at the techniques that are being employed, we may see a, a different kind of warfare that's being waged uh, in a particular scenario. And, and maybe that's the kind of warfare where, uh, you know, soldiers uh, are in combat and they're, they're not wearing a uniform. Or maybe there's a, a cyber component or a, an electronic warfare component. And we're able to look at that and then look across the world and say, hey, we saw this in this area. We see it also applied in this area, in this area. How do we develop a, a, a tactics, techniques Techniques and procedures to operate in that kind of environment. Again, you brought up uh, some uh, some great points that talk about how the nature of warfare itself has changed, and that's really what we're charging our soldiers to do. I I, I, I relish the old days when I, I knew what I was going to be called on to do, and that was uh, you know to get in my tank or armored personnel carrier and, and face an enemy and be able to you know uh, to, to kill him before he killed me. But now uh, the the world has changed, and in, in operating in this complex environment, we've got to have our soldiers to be prepared to do numerous missions and and I would hope that you'd find confidence uh, that hey there is somebody that is looking at that and the US Army is looking at uh, what is going on in the world today and preparing our soldiers uh, for the unknown George Conroe Texas you are up next for our guest good morning yes sir good morning thanks for taking my call first thing I want to do is thank Colonel Petkosik for his service 
there are three things that I have been hearing here and see here that impress me very much. The first is that citizens are asking questions. The second is that Colonel Petkosik's first response to those questions is that his loyalty is to the Constitution of the United States and that that is what circumscribes his actions. The third thing is, is that in this world today, we cannot afford to ignore the fact that we may be forced to fight on our own soil. And if that were to occur, I, from what I'm saying, I am quite certain that Colonel Petkosik and his men will be able to handle that situation completely within the law and the laws of our country and with the intent that the Constitution intended. And I want to thank you for your time, service, and thanks for the call. Thank you, George. I, I really do appreciate uh, your, your call and your comments. And it is, it's always, uh, it's, uh, it's awe-inspiring when you get to see what our, our soldiers are doing. And, and any chance we get to share that uh, with the American people uh, is, is really a, a, a great, great opportunity. Because it is, a, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the country's large and, uh, and soldiers are, 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 are spread across in different bases. And you don't always get a chance to, uh, to see what your soldiers are doing. So anytime we have an opportunity to highlight uh, for the American people, hey, this is your army, this is your military, it's something you should be proud of. And, uh, and you can rest assured that uh, you've got uh, the right people uh, doing the right things uh, for our nation. Uh, it, it's always a good thing. So thank you. Mike from Hinson, Alabama. Hi. How you do, sir? And Colonel, I want to congratulate you on your facility there. It's, it's uh, uh, remarkable. It's obviously uh, uh, state of the art. My son just uh, left the active army after three tours of Iraq and one of Afghanistan. And uh, I want to say I'm with you uh, and Plato, who said that uh, only the dead have seen the end of war. And we can't predict exactly what's going to happen. But I think what you're hearing in the voices of the people who called you today is the growing suspicion that the National Command Authority is in the hands of the domestic enemies of the Constitution. My question to you is, is quite simple and direct. What do you do when faced with an unconstitutional order? Well, Mike, we've got an obligation to support and defend the Constitution of the United States, and uh, you know, fortunately, I have uh, have not had to face that moral dilemma and say, "Hey, what uh, what choice do I make between some order and uh, you know the parameters as they're outlined by the Constitution?" And and uh, again, I raised my hand and said, "I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America," and that's what I'm I'm charged to do. Uh, and uh, as you talked about, uh, uh, that's what you know that's what our soldiers sign up for. And again, I I'm I'm glad to hear that you've got a, a a son who had served, and uh, you should be very proud that he made the choice and raised his hand just as I did uh, to do exactly that, support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Uh, and I'm sure, as, as he could tell you, um, that uh, a lot of the things that have been discussed in the program today um, are, are uh, maybe, maybe false perceptions about, you know, what our Army is here and what, what we're here to do. That's why I take an opportunity like this to share with you and the rest of the American people, uh, hey, this is what our Army is here for. Nothing is, has changed. This is the same Army. Uh, the United States Army existed uh, before uh, there was a United States of America. It is the oldest institution that we have in terms of, uh, in terms of our nation. And, uh, and we've been doing the same thing for uh, 200 and some odd years. Uh, whenever we're called, we go. So the nature of what the Army does for the American people hasn't changed, and it's only become stronger. Chesley, Cape Coral, Florida. Hi, go ahead. Yeah, hi. I would just like to ask the Colonel if he'd care to comment on uh, Operation Jade Helm 2015 and also our participation in Operation Maple Reserve, which will be held in Canada. I think it's ongoing now. And I was also okay, wondering Colin, about... Uh, Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the first exercise I'm, I'm unfamiliar with, but I am familiar with maple, uh, the, the maple up exercise being held up in Canada, and uh, you know that's one of those uh, great opportunities. And I don't know the details of, of what what the exercise and what they're trying to uh, accomplish. I can't speak intelligently about that, but it is one of those opportunities for us to work with our partners, and particularly our you know our, our Canadian partners. Those things are are important to us as an army. Uh, we all see what's going on in the world today, and different armies have different 
experiences. And part of the asymmetric warfare group, we are looking for best practices. We're looking for if, if uh, working with the Canadians reveals something to us that we say, hey, that's a great way to do something. Why don't we do that in the United States Army? That's something that we really gain from working with our partners. Uh, and uh, so again, I can't speak intelligently about the, the nature of it, but it, I know that we, uh, we are working with them to, to identify be best practices. Colonel, how do you know if what you're doing here is successful? That's the uh, that's the difficult part in terms of how do you measure you know how many lives does it save or how how does it work and really uh, getting ahead of the threat is is really the uh, the hardest part of it. Uh, so when we know it's successful when we go forward and uh, as I said we have soldiers and we ask them to do a lot of things and when we see those soldiers and we say hey I was at Fort A P Hill and we we did some adapt in the tunnels or we we looked at UASs and that helped prepare me for my mission that's how we measure success when we see units around the field and we get feedback that says what you're doing is important because everybody wants to feel that what they're doing you know has value and is important you know particularly our soldiers here uh, in the US Army I mean they sacrifice a lot they're away from their families uh, they spend time in some austere conditions and they want to know that it makes a difference and it makes a difference when you you know that hey you are you are helping soldiers on the battlefield you're helping make soldiers better prepared for their mission and ultimately uh, you know there's some uh, you know son daughter you know wife or husband that's going to go home safe because of that that thing that you did at Fort AP Hill Colonel John John Pekosik is the commander of the U.S. Army Asymmetric Warfare Group, and you're talking to us about uh, the nature of their work. Commander, thanks for your time. Major, thanks for having me. We also want to thank Fort A.P. Hill for their help and their hosting us. The video work you saw, by the way, was done by Bill Hefley and Justin Metzger, also edited by Kim White, and want to thank them as well. That's it for the Washington Journal today. A new program comes at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. We'll see you then.